It was November 26th, 1986, when Gary Heidnick claimed his first victim. This was the day that would begin a long series of kidnappings, rapes, and murders. Six lives would forever be changed in the duration of those four months. Some would get a second chance to make something of their lives once they got out. Others, unfortunately, would not. Gary Michael Heidnick was born on November 22, 1943, in East Lake, Ohio, to Michael and Ellen Heidnick. After his parents divorced in 1946, he and his brother Terry lived with their mother for four years. Then they were sent to their father and new stepmother. Heidnick claimed that his father emotionally abused him throughout his time living with him. The boy allegedly suffered from bedwetting problems and claimed that his father would humiliate him by forcing him to hang the wet sheets in the window where any passerby could see. At school, Heidnick was something of a loner, not really interacting much with any of his classmates and often refusing to make eye contact with them. When another student asked the innocent question of, did you get the homework done, Gary? He yelled at her and insisted that she was not worthy of speaking to him. Gary's brother Terry claims they were raised in a racist environment where their father believed life has no value if it's a black life. He was allegedly prejudiced against African Americans because his wife had multiple relationships with black men after their divorce. Michael Heidnick denied all of his son's claims. Despite his difficulties with social interaction, not to mention the bullying he endured in regards to his oddly shaped head, Heidnick performed well academically. His IQ was measured at 148. Despite his intelligence, however, he ultimately dropped out of organized education at the age of 17 and joined the U.S. Army. He served as a medic for 14 months before he was honorably discharged with a medical disability, after having been diagnosed with schizoid personality disorder, which is characterized by not desiring close personal relationships and coming off as cold and distant. People with this condition are typically described as loners or odd. Not long after his discharge, he became a nurse at a Veterans Administration Hospital. However, he was quickly fired for being rude to his patients. It became impossible for him to hold down a job. Beginning in August 1962, he was constantly in and out of psychiatric hospitals, and until his arrest in March 1987, he had attempted suicide 13 times, according to hospital and psychiatric records. Seeing as how it was so difficult to maintain a job in 1971, he formed his own church to support himself and avoid taxes. He called it the United Church of the Ministers of God. Beginning with only five followers, he opened an account with Merrill Lynch, the initial deposit being $1,500. Eventually, the account would be worth $500,000, which today, accounting for inflation, would be valued at $3,045,222.22. By 1986, the congregation was thriving and wealthy. And yet, something was missing. Thus, he used a matrimonial service to correspond with his future wife for two years before he finally proposed. Betty Disto arrived from the Philippines in September 1985 and married Heidnick in Maryland on October 3, 1985. What a fairy tale ending, right? Well, the marriage quickly deteriorated after she found Heidnick in bed with three other women. Throughout the course of their brief marriage, Heidnick forced his wife to watch while he had sex with other women. Disto also accused him of repeatedly raping and assaulting her. With the help of the Filipino community in Philadelphia, she was able to leave Heidnick in January of 1986. Unknown to Heidnick until his ex-wife requested child support payments in 1987, he impregnated Betty during their short marriage. On September 15, 1986, Disto had given birth to a son, who she named Jesse John Disto. He also had a child with Gail Linko, a boy named Gary Jr. The child was placed in foster care soon after his birth. Heidnick had a third child with another woman named Anjanette Davidson, who was illiterate and mentally disabled. Their daughter, Maxine Davidson, was born March 16, 1978. The child was immediately placed in foster care, and shortly after Maxine's birth, Heidnick was arrested for the kidnapping and rape of Anjanette's sister, Alberta, who had been living in an institution for the mentally disabled. This was the first actual imprisonment on his long record. However, his record really began in 1976, when he was charged with aggravated assault and carrying an unlicensed pistol after an argument led to him shooting the tenant of a house he had for rent, grazing his face. Two years after that assault, he signed his girlfriend's sister, Alberta Davidson, out on day leave from a mental institution, and she was missing for an alarmingly long amount of time. 
After she was finally found and returned to the hospital, examination revealed that she had been raped and sodomized and that she had contracted gonorrhea. Heidnik was arrested and charged with kidnapping, rape, unlawful restraint, false imprisonment, involuntary deviant sexual intercourse, and interfering with the custody of a committed person. The original sentence was overturned on appeal, and Heidnik spent three years of his incarceration in mental institutions prior to being released in April of 1983 under the supervision of a state-sanctioned mental health program. After his wife left him in 1986, he was arrested again and charged with assault, indecent assault, spousal rape, and involuntary deviant sexual intercourse. However, when his wife Betty did not appear in court, the charges were dropped. Heinick's infamous crime began with the abduction of Josefina Rivera in November of 1986. Within just three months, he had accumulated four additional captives to hold in his basement. For the entirety of their stay in Heinick's House of Horrors, each woman was repeatedly raped, beaten, and tortured. Two of them ended up dead. Josefina Rivera, Sandra Lindsay, Lisa Thomas, Debra Dudley, and Jacqueline Askins. Each one of the five women were African American of low economic or social status. Rivera and Askins were prostitutes, Lindsay was mentally disabled, and Thomas was a 19-year-old single mother. In an interview with a friend of Heidnick's, John Cassidy, he revealed that Heidnick had said that, quote, the blacks treated him better than the whites ever did. He also said he sexually preferred blacks, that they expected less, end quote. The women all either thought they were receiving a ride from a friendly stranger or a normal run-of-the-mill client. However, they were quickly disillusioned when he choked each of them and chained them to a bar across the ceiling in his basement. Soon, they were subjected to various forms of sexual torture and humiliation, as well as other torturous methods including starvation, electric shock, and screwdrivers driven into their ears so they could not hear him approaching. went upstairs and um, we had sex. And afterwards, I was getting dressed, and he came up behind me and started choking me. And, um, and he started choking me. But I, all I could remember was, I don't know, I guess it happened so fast. All I could remember was, like, a film projector of things that were going on in my life was, like, you know, just flipping back. Heidnick's goal in capturing the five women was to bear many children with each of them because he could no longer do so with his former wife. He took note of each of their vulnerabilities and took them without much difficulty. Heidnick tortured them to control them and raped them to impregnate them. Despite his efforts, not a single one of the girls got pregnant, and two of them were ultimately killed. It caused Sandra to go on punishment for all these days, you know, and um, he had her handcuffed like to the ceiling beams, like for, for a couple of days and she wouldn't eat and stuff. And he didn't, um, and he was trying to make her eat. And he was like putting, she was putting bread in her mouth. Because when you got on punishment, first he would just give you water, then he would give you bread and water. And then you like, I don't know, I guess like he would take away all your privileges and then you'd have to start all over again, you know? He, like, untakes a chain off and stuff, and, you know, he takes her upstairs. He got Sandra's head cooking in a pot upstairs, right? And he got her ribs and stuff in a little roasting pan in the oven, you know, and her arms and stuff is in the freezer. And he says that if I don't cut out, that I, this is going to be me. Allegedly, he also ground up her flesh, mixed it in with the dog food, and fed it to the other victims. But his defense attorney later claimed he had fabricated the account to help hide Nick's insanity case. Though the neighbors complained about the acrid stench hanging around Hyde Nick's house, he told the police he had merely burned a roast and they believed him. Having fooled the police, Hyde Nick was able to continue with his criminal activities. The second and final fatality was that of Deborah Dudley, who had been forced into a pit filled with water and live wired and was electrocuted to death. Her body was disposed of in New Jersey Pine Barrens. He used to fill uh, the hole up with water and take electrical wire. Well, like a plug that you plug in, he would take two, strip the two wires, and then um, he would take the wire while they're in the water and put it on their chains. And in the beginning, Deborah was, was hollering. And then she didn't holler anymore. He thought something was wrong with the wire. 
I said, look, look down there in that hole and see what's wrong with that girl. I said, because he kept saying, she keeps saying they were dead, that she laid face down in the water. So he finally listens up the board and he says, yeah, she is laying face down in the water. And he just like picks her up like by her hair, back of her head and something. He's like, yeah, he's right, she's dead. And now he's like, now all my troubles are over with. Now I can get back to having a peaceful basement. In March of 1987, Heidnik and Rivera, who, due to her compliance with assisting him, had become the man's favorite and earned his trust, abducted a sixth woman, Abigail Adams, also a prostitute. The next day, Rivera used the trust she gained to convince Heidnik to temporarily let her go so she could visit her family. When he allowed it, she went to the police instead. After some convincing, the police agreed to arrest Heidnik, as well as his best friend, Cyril Brown, who was let go on a $50,000 bail, and the agreement that he would testify against Heidnik in court. This marked the end of Gary Heidnik's house of horrors. In April, he attempted to hang himself in his jail cell, but was unsuccessful. Thus, the trials began. At his arraignment, Heidnik attempted to defend himself by claiming that the girls were already in his basement when he moved in. His defense attorney tried to prove that he was legally insane using the story regarding Sandra Lin Lindsay's body. However, his amassing of such a large amount of money in combination with testimony from his Merrill Lynch advisor, Robert Kirkpatrick, they were able to dispel the argument. Kirkpatrick called Heidnick an astute investor who knew exactly what he was doing. On July 1, 1988, he was convicted of two accounts of first-degree murder at the State Correctional Institute of Pittsburgh. In January of 1989, he attempted suicide again with an overdose of prescribed Thorazine. In 1997, his daughter and ex-wife filed for stay of execution, asserting that he was not competent to be executed. After two years, the U.S. District Court issued its final ruling stating that he would be executed. Gary Michael Heidnick was executed on July 6, 1999 by lethal injection. As of today, he is the last person to be executed in Pennsylvania. Gary Heidnick has had a strong impact on media today. In 1988, the punk rock band from Philadelphia, The Serial Killers, released a seven-minute single of their song, Gary Heidnick's House of Horrors. Included with the record was a small bag of dirt from the front yard of Heidnick's North Philadelphia row home. It also included a certificate of authenticity. He was also inspiration for Blind Faith in 1989, a direct-to-video picture film by Dean Wilson that was based upon this true story of Philadelphia's sex killer, Gary Heidnick. He even served as inspiration for Buffalo Bill in Silence of the Lambs. Okay, 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 Mr. If you let me go, I won't. I won't press charges, I promise. See, my mom is a real important woman. I, I guess you already know that. Heidnick was directly responsible for ruining, and for some, ending, the lives of six young women in Philadelphia. His drawn-out serial rape and murder led to the trauma of Josephina Rivera, Lisa Thomas, Jacqueline Askins, and Agnes Adams, the deaths of Sandra Lindsay and Deborah Dudley, and even to his own demise. Unfortunately, he will continue to live on within the surviving victims' minds. He just created his own little world in his basement, and everybody just kind of pretty much dealt with it, I guess, in their own way. Once lost, now recovered, these tiny fragments of the past come together in my jars at home, reformed from old structures into new shapes and pieces. Like the pieces of an unknown jigsaw, they take on a new life and meaning on my windowsill. They have survived. In some way, shape, and form, they have adapted, changed, and survived. And sometimes that is enough. Josefina Rivera in her book, Cellar Girl. <laughs>